thank you, Westmore family, for the opportunity to stand up here tonight. Uh, I don't know if Dad really knew what he was doing when he's given me this mic. Uh, a lot of stories have gone on out of this pulpit uh, in my direction. So now it's time for payback. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> I wanted to talk tonight and um, just kind of bring some themes that Westmore's been going through, uh, all to just kind of intertwining some things and letting your sons, uh, you know, speak and daughters speak and everybody, you know, kind of rallying around that and listening to what some of the earlier generation or the younger generation is saying uh, has really been quite, it's been awesome. I've been out at the Caveman's Club and listened to Zach and Jared and some of their threads and um, also been listening to what's been coming out of the pulpit um, through dad and, and just through the ministry and Sunday evenings and the love and the grace and mercy and all the things that are intertwined as to what our role is as a church. And that's really what dad's been digging at and, and what our role is as a church corporately, but also what is our role as the church individually. And that's really the heart and that's really why our churches have lost in many ways and in many places a hold in their communities is because they have withdrawn. So some of the things you're going to hear tonight, um, don't send me an email, send it to him. <laughs> uh, I'm just giving him a hard time. But I don't mean anything to, to ever come across in a way that is not in the most humble of states, but it is in a reality of where we are and what our role is and how we continue to build relationships and build people, which is the foundation of what our job is as Christians. And so with that in mind, as Roger uh, throws the PowerPoint, I don't know, there we go. Uh, who and how, Relationships 101. And this is what I deal with day in and day out. And many of you know, yes, uh, you know, the director of the Pi Center as that comes and unfolds, but currently, my job in the Bradley County School System is also uh, directing Goal Academy, which deals with a lot of different students from a lot of different places, and it has nothing to do with your social status. I deal with the highest of high in this area and the lowest of low. Social status has no boundary or barrier on the students that I deal with that are broken that come to me day in and day out. With that said, they're all crying for the same thing, something I can't give them in the school setting. They just don't know it. They're all crying for the exact same thing. And it's you, it's me. It's people that have Christ. And so as we begin to look at what our role is, our role isn't just for the people that don't have Christ, but it's also for those that do have Christ. I grew up in a pastor's home. And in Cleveland, Tennessee, some of you guys are pastor's kids. And we've got a whole lot of pastor's kids that aren't sitting in these chairs and there's a reason for it. That's just the real. <laughs> so again, you might not want to hear it, but that's just straightforward. So what is our role? And I'll tell you right now, the young people coming up want real. They want real. They want to know what the real is. What's the real story? What's the real journey? Because here's the reality. Well, mom and dad used to say, I can fact check. And what mom and dad used to say, I can go back to, and if that's really not the truth, then I, <laughs> they don't even know what they're talking about. Okay? So as we begin to work through these things, which I tell people all the time, I think they're the devil in many ways. <laughs> okay? Um, they do have a purpose, and I am a millennial, I was told. Uh, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, I grew up in the generation with these. I, I, I played video games. I know what these things are all about. But there's a time and a place. And that's what we haven't taught our kids. See, these have become our babysitters. And we stopped having communication and we stopped mentoring and we, start, we stopped coaching. I was fortunate enough to have parents that regulated this. Now a lot of parents give it to them as a babysitter. They don't want to pay the babysitter, so I'll give them this thing, okay? So how do we begin to connect back? 
And there's some very specific ways that Paul, he, he has a son in the faith. His name is Titus. And Titus 2 gives us some very specific ways that we can look at for the older generation. But this isn't just for the older generation tonight. There's some younger generation in here too. And we need to open our ears up and see what needs to be done on our end. And then what do we do with the friend, the friend side to side brother that doesn't know the Lord and the one that does know the Lord? Because we treat them differently based on where the relationship is. Does that make sense? So I don't want to lose you right now. So who and how? So the first thing we're going to hit, Roger, if you could move that, our circle of influence. What I want you to start thinking about is what is your circle of influence? Because you're not going to leave here tonight without asking myself, who can I influence and how can I do it? Who and how? And you need a strategy. You need a game plan. First off, for the younger, for the sons and the daughters, who can you attach to? Who's your circle of influence? And I'm going to use this word mentorship, but there's a lot of connotations to it that I don't think it's kind of become a coin term. I need a mentor. Well, do you really want a mentor, son? <laughs> do you really want a mentor? Because a mentor is somebody who can speak into you. Okay? And you've got to be willing to be ready to be spoken into. Does that make sense? And so in my own life, I've got some mentors, both in the faith, but also at the job level. Okay, I've got people all around me and I'm always asking, is there something I can do differently? Is there something else I can do? Is there a different way to look at this? Help me understand. What's going on in your head? You've been around. What, what can I do differently? So as we begin to look, ask. The book of Proverbs is all about what? Wisdom. So if we want wisdom, we need to be, younger generation, we need to be asking. I know there's a few, Zeke, if you don't start speaking up, you're gonna start asking up here, here in a minute. I love this guy. Zeke back here, I'm having fun. He and I have been mentoring each other, haven't we, Zeke? <laughs> He's so mad at me right now. <laughs> but the theme of Proverbs is wisdom. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask. So we're gonna fast forward to Proverbs 19. If you've got your word, everything that I do, I want it to line up here, okay? I want it to line up here. If it doesn't say it here, then don't, and we'll get more into this here in a second, it's gotta line up here. So listen, work, be kind on the younger generation in. So let's look at this, okay? Proverbs 19. Everybody there? Are you getting there? We're going to start with verse 13, okay? It says, a foolish son is the ruin of his father. Contentious wife, it goes into, and then it says, houses and riches are in the inheritance from his father. But a prudent wife is from the Lord. Laziness casts one into a deep sleep. An idle person will suffer hunger. He who is careless of his ways will die. Who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. He will pay back what he has given. Chasten your son while there is hope. Did you just hear that? Chasten your son while there is hope. Chasten, you can also substitute the word discipline, right? Discipline while there's hope. We, have, we are trying to discipline older, older folks when they're already into their ways. What happened with disciplining when we're very absolute? Does that make sense? With that said, do not set your heart on destruction. And that's a very key thing. Chasing your son, but not to the point, do not set your heart. The person that's doing the chastening, that's what it's saying here, do not set your heart on destruction. In other words, do not destroy him or her. Do not destroy their spirit. Did you just hear what I just said? You cannot break them. You chasten them, but you do not break them. There's a difference. And I get a lot of broken young people. I get a lot of broken individuals that have been disciplined to the point that you can't, okay? So there's a fine line in that discipline. 
But then it says, a man of great wrath will suffer punishment. For if you rescue him, you have to do it again. Did you just hear that? We're gonna come back to that in a minute. Listen to the counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in latter days. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel that will stand. Proverbs is very powerful. And one of the things I am so grateful for is that my parents pushed me through the book of Proverbs from a young age. I've already started doing this with Jacob because it speaks to the heart. It speaks to how we look at things. And as we listen, this passage talked about listening, receiving counsel, working, not being lazy, and being kind. Those are the core values as a young man that if we have those three things, if we'll listen, if we'll work hard, and if we'll treat people with kindness, the sky's the limit. Older generation, I know employers all over the place, they just want somebody that has those three things. Okay, somebody that has those three things. With that said, lean and learn. And what do I mean by lean? Lean on this. This is the word, that's what I'm alluding to, not the, not the phone, okay? Lean on the word. Go back to the word, younger generation, fact check it in the word. Go back to the word, know your word. But then if you know your word, ask. Are you sure that's the way that was meant? Are you sure that was the way that was insinuated? Because I struggle with some things that I've been taught. My dad and I have had these conversations. I really struggle with some, some things and I'm what, sixth generation church of God? Is that where I'm at now? I struggle with some things. Lining up with this. Because I found myself in, in positions to be able to influence relationships. They really struggle with some of these things. And so I'm not trying to polarize in any way my forefathers or my grandfathers. But I have a job and that's to influence. And it's to be kind. And it's to love. And love is the combination of grace and mercy. Right? So younger generation, I hope your ears are opening I hope you're hearing, listen, work hard, be kind. And when you want something or when you want to learn something, ask. Ask. That shows that you want to learn. Look for that person around you. When you walk out of here today, who's in your circle? There's a reason why there's a circle at the top of that PowerPoint. Who's in your circle that you can go to, that you can ask? There's nothing better than sitting out, working hard with a young man that was in this room, who's in this room right now, earlier this summer, and he didn't know how to do something. And I was super proud that he looked at me and he said, I don't know how to do that. Don't go spend 30 minutes acting like you know how to do it and burning my time up. Ask me, right? <laughs> and he asked, and then we talked through it. And we're kind as we talk through it. Does that make sense? Next step. Roger, if you can go ahead and trip to the next one. This one's for the fathers and mothers. And again, circle of influence. Think about who you influence, who's around you. And I'm not just talking about believers. I'm talking about unbelievers as well. There's a point right after that, and it says convictions are keyless. Communication is key. Now, I'm going to explain that because that sometimes can... Oof. When you get into relationships with people, your convictions may not be my convictions. Does your convictions line up with the word? What you may have had an issue with in you and your family may not be what my and my family have an issue with. What your heart got off track with in your family and in your home may not be the same for me and mine. Do you understand what I said? And so when you start thinking about you're speaking into that next generation, it's got to line up here. If it can't line up here, then there's no place for it. So what does Titus 2 say? Okay, let's go ahead and trip over to Titus 2. 
We're going to start with Titus 2, verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Okay, so he's telling Titus, speak the things that are proper for sound doctrine as you start coaching, okay? It says that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, and patience. Love, patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. He's not being ugly here. When you don't have order, then it creates division. So he's trying to create a family unit here. The older men, the older women, how we need to operate, teach your younger women, not to be out of order with your younger men. That creates the family unit. And so that's the kind of thing we need to be coaching. Okay? Keeping things strong and together. Then it says, likewise exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned. That one who is an opponent may be ashamed of having nothing evil to say of you. Now, there was something just a minute ago in Proverbs that I'm tripping back and forth just a little bit. But we don't want people speaking evil of you, not hating you, not despising you. It talks about the correction that we give, but yet not being despised. Would you not agree that sometimes when you give correction, it causes people to despise you? It can. The ironic thing we have to ask ourselves or we have to look in the mirror is how did we give that correction? Was it for the hope of restoration? Was it kind? I've had parents come into my office and by the time I get done, having to deal with a discipline issue, putting their arms around my neck and hugging me for expelling their son or daughter. Now that just sounds crazy, doesn't it? But they understand at the end of the day that it is for the hope of restoration in a way that I'm trying to take them on this journey to understand consequences and talking through this with them and why they are where they are and what's going on not getting into convictions, but lining things up. And so as we begin to get into these things, it's important that we know what the word says. I'm going to skip down, trained by saving grace. Verse 11, for grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Did you hear that? Rebuke with all authority, mentor. But let no one despise you. I hope you caught that. It's okay to rebuke, but don't get to the point where they despise you. Don't discipline in Proverbs to the point where you've created a hard issue because you've broken them. And in many cases, the lack of journey and grace and mercy, when we don't feel the grace and mercy, then it becomes broken and despising. And we've got a culture who despises the what? The church. Do we not? Because people have been broken. Take a step back. What is our role? What is our role? And who's in our circle? A few of those scripture verses that I just pulled out, chasing while there is still hope, 
Back in Proverbs, we talked about that, going to come back to that. We do this when they're young, but as they get older, we have to cut the cord. Woo. <laughs> okay? We have to step back. I've seen, and I, I've got grandparents sitting with parents and now dealing with kids, and the grandparents talking more than the kid is, and the grandkid doesn't know which one to listen to. Okay? I'm not trying to be ugly, but at some point, we got to step back. And maybe I'm preaching to the, you know, the choir here on this, but the reality is we've got to take a step back. Let those young people grow and go and coach along the way. That's one thing that I'm very blessed to have in my ear over here. And I call them, Dad, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? Other people, what do you think about this? I thank God for the Mr. Winners. Mr. Winters, what do you think about this? You know, Mr. Tarver, I, I can go all the way around the room. Mr. Ray, I have several people in here. That pick, what do you guys think about this? What do you, will you take a look at this? And you know what? I'm ready to take it. Punch me hard because I know these guys love me. And they care about me. Speak in. But then there's a fine line to speaking in and ripping somebody to the point where they despise you. And that's really what we're driving at here is the heart issue. The overall theme of God's word is not to destroy people. It's to love. It's to love. It's to love. It's to love. And thankfully, I had a father who loved us enough to protect us from some of the things that were very legalistic. And it allowed me not to have that, I don't know, maybe blurred appearance of the church in some ways. But guys, that's where we have to be. We have to coach from here. Does that make sense? Let's go to the next one, Roger. So our circle of influence in the church and out of the church. So this deals, begins to deal with our relationships outside of that mentor or that son-daughter and outside of, if I'm the son or daughter, that mentor, this deals with what we do here. And we've been talking about this a lot on Sunday nights. Robert can tell you and others can tell you that have been spotting in and out. But inside the church, iron sharpens iron, right? Inside the church, you know Jesus, I know Jesus, I ought to be able to speak into you, you're a brother, and if there's something I see, I ought to be able to tell you, hey, here's where we are, but it better line up with this. Sometimes even inside the church, we're pushing convictions that aren't here. <laughs> okay? So iron sharpens iron. Speak into each other. But outside the church, no, 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 no. Love, mercy, grace. Those relationships outside the church, whoo, I get people that don't claim to be Christians and a Christian person telling them how they have to live. How does that work? If I have no moral compass and don't even believe this to be real, why do I want to hear anything about your moral compass and way that you think I should live? That causes me to despise you. And so it's our job to love them. Spread seed, spread seed, spread seed. Love, love, love. But I'm a waitress out here at a restaurant on Sunday afternoons and I hate working on Sunday afternoons because I don't feel very loved when I don't have a tip from the church people. I mean, I'm just being real. <laughs> I'm starting to meddle. But these are the realities, okay? What are we doing? What are we showing? We're to be loving people outside the church and inside the church, iron sharpening iron. And so I wanted to just kind of Bring some of the threads together with grace and mercy and love and the things dad's been talking about. But also the theme I heard out of Caveman's, Jared and Zach both, as they were speaking, both also stepped back and they were talking about their mentors that allowed them to become who they are today. I've got mentors in this room, Mr. Winters, who hired me and gave me a shot and dad and others 
that have been in this room, the Mike Watkins in this room, mentors in this family room that have journeyed with me who have allowed me to become who I am today. And so there's this theme of love, grace, mercy, but also this mentorship with sons and daughters prophesying where we've got to kind of wrap this together. And as we go out, we should all be mentoring somebody. We should all be mentoring somebody. But there is some guidelines in how we do that. And so that's kind of what I wanted to bring together because I'm going to tell you something. There's people all over this community that need somebody. All over it. And if you don't believe it, show up tomorrow at 209 Sunset Drive, Cleveland, Tennessee. Just being real with you. Just looking for a relationship. Just looking for a relationship. The common thread, the common theme, no matter what social status, is a broken down family. The broken down family unit. And when you're broken down in the family unit, just a perpetual cycle. But that can be healed. That can be helped. Does that make sense? And it can be healed and helped by what we have in here, and that's Christ. Christ has to get out there and heal those through us. Christ doesn't get out there unless we take him there. There are gonna be Christian people because Christ is gonna make sure his people are taken care of, so don't take that wrong, but it's a call for us to get out there with people and show love and show Christ. So dad, thank you. I know I'm hitting close on time, but thank you for the opportunity. And as I wrap things up, I wanted to say a word of prayer tonight, but don't pray this if you don't mean it because I found it to be very true. When I'm starting to feel like I'm not influencing people, and I always say, God, put somebody in my life, put somebody in my path, but don't pray that if you don't want it because I got news. Every single time I've prayed that, within the next couple days, there's somebody, it's like, bam, you asked for it, now here you go. So, uh, but my prayer is for everybody to feel like they can put into somebody one way or the other. And if you feel like you're not in a place where you can do that anymore, or maybe you've already done so much of that, you don't need to do it anymore. I'm older. You wouldn't be here if there wasn't a reason for you still to be here. So don't walk out of here and say, I don't have the ability or the purpose or the network. There's somebody that you touch. Whether it's the Dunkin' Donuts lady giving you a coffee every day, you can be kind and show love. And pay for the guy behind you just to show her that you're kind and showing love. Just saying. Okay? Uh, so just some food for thought. Don't crucify me. I appreciate it, Dad. And send him the emails. But um, with that said, let's wrap things up tonight with a word of prayer. And in the prayer, I want you to think about who. Think about that person. Think about that name. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for a church that, uh, that brings the word, that lines things up with the word. I thank you for a home, for a father that's done that my entire life. Said not to believe him, but to go to the word and direct us back to the word and always look at the word and examine the word and what it's saying. God, I pray that you would get, continue to put us deeper and deeper in the word. God, we long for your heart from the word, not just what the words say, but what is the heart of the word, God? That's the conviction that I long for. God, as we launch, as we go out after this Wednesday midweek service, God, help us to take your heart to somebody else. As we begin to influence people, there are people that look up to every single person in here. No matter the age, there's people that look up to them. And I pray, God, that you would help them influence through love, grace, mercy, and being kind. God, give us your wisdom as we go out of here. Keep everybody safe and give us a wonderful final rest of the week. In the name of Jesus, amen.